All right. Well, I am not going to introduce. Uh, I'm not going to introduce uh, Congresswoman uh, McMorris Rogers because David uh, just did that. So we're going to just jump right in uh, to this to this really, I think, interesting conversation. Um, Are you going to start with the cosmic crisp, the greatest invention yes, in apples? We were just talking about that. <laughs> If you haven't eaten, I, I want to eat it. I haven't heard, I haven't yes. eaten it yet. Well, it's on the market now. Yeah. Developed at Washington State University. Absolutely. And then, you know, and I'm just, it's just kind of fun that we have a new apple that is tastes better than ever and lasts longer than ever. And, you know, it's just another example of American ingenuity. So there's two apples. <laughs> yes, there's two apples. <laughs> it's the other apple. Uh, but no, you're right. Actually, that is in about innovation, in which we lose sight of. That innovation is much bigger than what we're talking about today. Uh, talking about what we're talking about today, uh, ENC is, as I think as everybody knows, is really the hub of where these issues around AI, privacy, 5G, and others are debated and, and discussed and move forward in Congress. Can you say a little bit more about that, and particularly your role in the, that process? Sure. Well, it seems to me that the, the issues around innovation technology, the issues in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee right now, winning 5G, AI, making sure that America continues to lead in AI are at the, uh, are at the forefront of our economy, our national security. It's going to determine whether or not America leads, whether or not America wins, uh, continues in global dominance. So these issues are are very important to our future, and I'm excited to be the lead Republican on the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee, working with Jan Schurkowski as the chair on, on many of these issues, and, and really pleased to see the crowd here today. So I want to, let's jump into 5G. We can't talk about this without talking about 5G. We'll probably have to talk about 5G, blockchain, and AI, and uh, other buzzwords, but let's talk about 5G. There's a lot of... With 4G, we didn't really talk very much about a race. It was like we were leading 4G. We did all the right things, and we did lead 4G. With 5G, we're obviously talking about a race, particularly with China. And that ends up conflating, I think, two issues. One is just how our network providers, our, our wireless providers are going to deploy 5G, and is it going to be faster than China? And the second is, is network equipment companies, which we don't have any anymore, really. We have Huawei and then Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung to some extent. What are the implications on the deployment side of what the carrier are doing if we don't uh, adopt it expeditiously? Right, well, it's a significant impact. And on, on 4G, we led smartphones and apps, and we saw the millions of jobs, billions of, uh, 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 billions of dollars to our GDP. It was significant impact. And, as, and clearly, we are in a race with China right now. Uh, and as I said, from an economic perspective and also from a national security perspective, I believe it is so important that we are leading and that, we are doing, that we're deploying 5G in a way that will ensure that security to our economy as well as our national security. Uh, you know, I often like to remind people that in order for America to be a diplomatic power, we have to be a military power. To be a military power, you have to be an economic power. It's, it's all connected. And it seems to me it's all connected around 5G right now. And where we go with 5G is so important. Uh, in China, they, you know, they've taken a very different approach. Uh, and and that race is is clear. You, you, and just kind of taking a step back, China has gotten to where they are largely by stealing intellectual property and by state-owned in enterprises. And that is the biggest concern with Huawei right now is that you have a you know a, a company that is largely going to be more dependent or uh, beholden to the Chinese government. And what does that? And how do we make sure that we have protections in place? Uh, and, and so I believe it is very important that we are moving forward. Um, some of the um, challenges that we've had, you know, we don't have the networking uh, capability right now, the gear, and we need to be, de we need to be developing that in America. And I, I think that that is critical to us uh, winning and moving forward. So just to build on that point a little bit, um, the interesting history, I don't think very many people really understand or remember, but back in 1919, uh, in World War I, the Navy was quite concerned about dependence on foreign wireless providers 
Marconi, uh, the Italian, and we were dependent on Marconi International, it was an Italian and UK company. And the Navy said that just is unacceptable. We, we, the Navy needed its own equipment. So they, uh, through a presidential action, uh, they ended up buying up Marconi patents in the US and building essentially, or creating essentially what was called the Radio Corporation of America, we know of as RCA, as an independent part of GE. Uh, that was pretty kind of clearly directional action by government. But people are talking about similar things today. For example, could we leapfrog and go to 6G? Could we support American companies or American and European partners to do 6G? Or what people now are talking about is software-defined networks. That maybe the Huawei advantage, which the hardware being the core component, maybe we can leapfrog them with the software-defined networks. How do you see all of that? And do you see there's a role for government there? Well, I... I I, I largely want to be incentivizing the private sector. I believe that the the the, the best uh, the the private sector responds the quickest and can be more innovative. And so my my hope is that we can continue to focus on the private sector leading with this technology and and, and getting us to a place where uh, it's not the government. Now I know that there's a group of senators that have worked on some legislation that is around creating these secure networks and, and finding this, this balance between innovation and security is going to be one of our biggest challenges moving forward. So one of the things I, I find a little confusing uh, in the debate is uh, the president has implemented a ban on, on uh, Chinese equipment in our mm-hmm. network providers and our the major telcos have all agreed they're even without that, they're not going to buy Huawei or ZTE equipment. So should we really be worried about network security once we have that ban in place? There's an issue, obviously, with rural carriers where they might have to do rip and replace. But it seems to me, at least domestically, we should be pretty secure. Well, I, I think we're going, to, um, we're going to have to just be vigilant, and that's going to be ongoing. And, and you know, there's, there's this concern about developing two networks as such, and the decision that Great Britain is making right now on Huawei is is uh, playing into that. But uh, in America, I believe that getting to 5G as soon as possible and releasing the spectrum that is needed is is one of the best. You know, we we need to move move forward as soon as possible. We've done well with the the low and the high bands, but that that mid band and the disagreements that we've had over the C band, we need to. Uh, get beyond interagency squabbles and the the industry uh, squabbles and get to a place where we can actually move forward because it is critical to our future. And you mentioned the the, the rural broadband and closing the digital divide. You know, I come from a district in eastern Washington that this is very, very important. Probably the number one issue in my district right now is closing the digital divide. You get outside of Spokane at all, and people are desperate, uh, and it's it's mixed as far as what kind of coverage they have, and it's it's foundational to their economic future. You know, everything is tied to the internet, healthcare, education. So they're saying we just need one G, right? So we 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 are we're, we're as a country we've been focused we're we're focusing on five G, which we need to do. And, and be vigilant, but we also need to make sure that we're taking action to close the digital divide. And that's where I'm, I'm encouraged with Chairman Pai and, and the continued focus he's bringing to more resources. Uh, uh, I'm encouraged that from a congressional perspective, we're, we're looking at the mapping to make sure that we're taking action that is going to uh, ensure no one's left behind. Maybe one last question on 5G. Are there, are there things that the committee can be doing? A lot of this is just simply going to be things that the FCC has to do or NTIA or others, but uh, are there things that the committee can do, particularly around oversight and sense of Congress telling the administration what you think they have to be doing? Right. Well, I think the, so far the committee has been focusing more on the, the, the mapping issue for the rural broadband in particular, just recognizing that there's more work that needs to be done um, but probably oversight would be appropriate too. Great. So let me switch over to privacy. Uh, we now are going to be facing another onslaught of uh, notices around. Uh, I love the last onslaught of notices when GDPR went in place that I still suffer from. Um, yes, I will accept that cookie. 
Uh, I don't know what California is going to bring us. Um, I was reading um, actually an, 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 uh, right, a, little, a little piece you had written, or at least came out this morning, uh, Congresswoman, and it, it was around the issues of having a, a patchwork of state laws and, and the problems with that. And, and you wrote, quote, a patchwork of state laws would drive up compliance costs and those costs would be passed on to the consumer. Can you say a little bit more about that? What, what are the problems if we don't get a national framework that that really avoids that? I come from Washington State. Washington State is in their legislative session, and they're debating a privacy law for Washington State. CCPA is going into effect right now in California. There's nearly 80 other state laws that are being introduced across the country and in the state legislatures. So it's, it's easy to see where we're very quickly developing a patchwork of laws at the state level that will be, could be in, con, will be, there's uh, the potential of being in conflict with one another and creating more co uh, confusion for the consumer as well as making it very difficult on the businesses. You, you could see where a business would say, well, we almost have to black out this state, which, you know, the internet knows no boundaries. So the, the work that we're doing around privacy is very important. Uh, people often ask, well, it's 2020, big election year. It's going to uh, be difficult to get things done. I, I certainly believe that. And yet I think there is an opportunity around privacy in particular. As C CPA is going into effect, as more states are debating privacy at the state level, it's going to raise the awareness as to the importance of there being a national standard. And the work that we're doing on the Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee uh, that Jan Scherkowski has been leading and I have been joining her, I'm proud that we have a, a staff draft that, uh, at least some sections, that we released just before Christmas around privacy. We are continuing to work toward a bipartisan bill on privacy. And I, I know that other efforts have fallen apart this Congress, but it needs to happen. And the chair would, and both the chair of the subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee would like to move forward on a bipartisan privacy bill. Um, the, the staff draft was, was focused on um, strict uh, inf uh, protections for consumers. It also included uh, enforcement uh, mechanisms with the FTC, but ensuring that the state AGs can also bring forward, they're going to play a very important role in privacy as we move forward. Uh, we're, we're getting the feedback right now. We're going through the comments that we have received. Uh, and the goal is to have a strong bill, strong language at the national level that would be stronger than California and a model that people could support and say, you know what, this is some, this would, this would be better and stronger and clearer uh, at the national level and get that national uh, standard in place. Uh, I do not support a private right of action um, and believe that the, the work that has been done to date in this bill, uh, in the draft language around allowing the making sure that there's strong roles for the state AGs and then in, in increased enforcement at the FTC is the, is the way to go that's going to um, not have a, a, a negative impact on the, the small businesses and the innovators and the startups of the future. Uh, one of my biggest concerns with GDPR has been the increase in enforcement or uh, 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 um, compliance cost that are impacting the, the startups in, in Europe right now, you see that there's a decrease in the number of startups. And America has led the world in innovations and new technologies. And we need to make sure as we move forward with privacy that we're doing it in a way that's going to ensure that next generation of startups and, and innovators here in America. Yeah, I think, yeah, you raised to me at a central point, which... I don't think it's gotten enough attention, and that's just the compliance costs of this. A lot of the privacy advocates 
imply that there's really either, either that there are no costs or that the costs are meaningless because privacy is so important that we should pay, as Kennedy would say, pay any price, bear any burden. Uh, the Europeans certainly are paying a big price and bearing a big burden, as you noted. Uh, you know, there are websites you can't access in Europe now because American companies said it's too difficult for, right. for uh, my company to do right. that. And I've, I've heard from some of the larger tech companies, well, you know, we'll take care of it. I want to make sure that we have that next generation of competitors to the large companies and the startups and the next generation of innovators. Sure, sure, absolutely. So ITIF wrote a report recently that did a very detailed uh, cost analysis of what a sort of GDPR slash California bill would cost versus a bill that's more still strong but balanced and, and, and sort of somewhat restrained, but still providing strong protections. And the difference with Stark, uh, we estimated that a GDPR-style bill in the U.S. would have $120 billion a year compliance costs. Um, that's a lot of money for a typical middle-class home, home, if you bear that, compared to a reasonable bill that would, again, still provide protections of $6 billion. So the delta is, is quite large. How do you see members on the committee thinking about that question? How do you make sure you get protection without, you know, making the cost so big that people suffer? Right. Well, that that cost is significant. And when it comes to small businesses, startups, any business, that's going to be a significant cost. And it's going to create another barrier. So I think it, uh, the members of the committee are very sympathetic to that. I would also uh, suggest that I'm not sure... <clears throat> that CCPA is really creating the trust that we want with individuals. <clears throat> I'm sorry. The, the goal of privacy is to create trust with the consumers. <clears throat> Sound like I'm crying. <laughs> uh, but to create trust with the consumers so that we can move forward with more technology and more innovation. Sure, absolutely. So we've got about three minutes left, and I just uh, there, there's a, we could talk for hours, um, <coughs> especially if you had water. Um, <laughs> but I want to just close on on this question of AI. Uh, I, I had uh, lunch last week, in honor of having lunch with the head of the. Uh, Europe has created this high-level working group on AI, and, uh, and, and the chair of it, a very interesting uh, uh, gentleman, a CEO from Finland. We were talking about what Europe is doing in this space. And, um, you know, in general, uh, Europe has this view, or I think many European policymakers have this view, that if they regulate AI very, very strongly, there you go. Oh that if you regulate it very strongly, um, the around things like you can only use data for what you say you're using it for and other things like that, that it will somehow convince people to use more AI and it'll convince companies or, and consumers around the world to buy EU AI, uh, not, this, uh, not this cowboy capitalism American AI. Um, but it clearly uh, has some challenge. Well, how do you see that sort of the risk of us going down the EU path when it comes to AI? Right, well, it's been America that's been the innovator, right? This has been the, the land that we have led on the new technologies. And the regulatory approach doesn't result in more innovation. That's why America has always said a light touch. AI is, uh, you know, is, it has huge potential and it's going to be revolutionary in so many different industries. Uh, precision, agriculture, manufacturing, healthcare. There's just uh, uh, untold ways that AI is going to improve our lives and impact our lives. I applaud the way that the administration is leading to date, the principles that they have put forward. Again, we can, we should, we're very, you know, I'm, I'm proud that America is leading on AI and we need to make sure that we continue to lead. China is, is investing a lot. They're on our heels. But you look at the way China is using AI today. Uh, in some parts of China, there's one camera for every six citizens. Uh, they are tracking uh, movements. They are uh, using AI against the minorities and the dissidents in China. And, um, but they're also selling you know, their equipment around the world. So we need to make sure that we are leading in AI and that uh, we're doing it with a light regulatory touch that always honors America's values and principles around freedom and human rights and human dignity. 
So yeah, ITI, again, we are hawking our reports. We wrote a report last year where we looked at about 15 or 20 quantitative indicators of AI progress, including venture funding, startups, scientists, publications. And uh, we still do lead the Chinese in AI, uh, but they're, they lead Europe, and they're catching up quickly. But I think to sort of wrap this all up, the, I think the administration, Michael Kratzios' uh, AI principles that the administration released, uh, the privacy work you've been doing, these are all about getting the balance right, about moving forward with legitimate concerns, but doing it in a way that allows innovators and innovation to happen. So I, I hope that that process can continue and that we move forward with